Good day, everyone. I want to thank you all for taking the time to watch the IHS Sanitation Facilities Construction presentation on understanding your septic system and how to maintain it. I'm Commander Josh Sims, the Tribal Utility Consultant for Southern California, and I'll be narrating this presentation, which was put together by the SFC O&M staff for California area. Thanks to Captain Jonathan Rash, Ricky Wright, and Fillmore Harvey for their time and input. So briefly, today we're going to cover the why, what, and how of septic systems and their maintenance. Why being, what is the intent or end goal of this presentation? The what being, what exactly is a septic system? And the how, as in how should you operate and maintain your septic systems? So first off, the why. Why have we put this together for you and why should you pay attention? So why are we recording this presentation and why are you watching today? Whether your septic system was installed by an IHS contractor or not, contractors typically have not provided great guidance to homeowners on how to maintain their systems, and IHS staffing does change over time. So it's important to provide homeowners with the information as they are traditionally the ones that will be sticking around. There has been a mixed bag on what training has been provided to homeowners. We want to help every homeowner and provide you with the information necessary for the maintenance of your systems in order to protect the health of you, your families, and your communities. Our goal in this training is to reach out to homeowners to make sure that you understand why we treat wastewater, what your septic system is, what it does, and to make sure that you know how to maintain it. Just to give a brief background, Throughout history, there have been and continue to be many occurrences of illness and death associated with sanitation-related diseases. An example of this is in London in 1858, there was an event known as the Great Stink. In the 20 plus years leading up to the Great Stink, over 40,000 people died due to cholera outbreaks. Some of the most dramatic events are highlighted on this slide. The infant mortality rate was about 50%, and at this time, people didn't understand that the disease was spread through contaminated water, but thought it was due to bad air or miasma. For those Game of Thrones fans out there, Sir Jonathan Snow, a London doctor, published a paper trying to alert people to the real cause. The sewer system was then redesigned by Joseph Bazalget to reroute sewage out of the metropolitan areas to the mouth of the Thames River. While a lot of this sewer system is still in use today, it wasn't perfect. It resulted in a large, quote-unquote, mud bank at the end of the Thames, and in 1878, a ship called the Princess Alice sunk there, and 650 more people died drowning in the toxic raw sewage. And those deaths listed were just related to cholera. That is only one of the many possible diseases that are associated with sewage and potential contamination of drinking water. I won't read all of these for you, but crypto, E. coli, hepatitis, typhoid, blue baby syndrome, all can affect populations from insufficient wastewater treatment. They are very serious illnesses, and although we tend to think that I'll be fine and won't hurt me, it's important to remember that typically the people that are most susceptible to these diseases are the youth and elders of our communities. So when I say we are trying to protect the public health, I don't mean just you. I mean everyone in your community. The United Nations has found that 3 in 10 people worldwide lack safe drinking water. 2.4 billion lack access to basic wastewater facilities. More than 80% of wastewater is discharged into waters without proper treatment. A thousand children die every day due to illnesses that can be prevented by water and wastewater treatment. Why am I telling you all these numbers? It's not to scare you or make you feel bad or any of that. It's not just here, but all over the world, water and wastewater tends to be out of sight, out of mind. People don't typically think about it until there's a problem. As a side note, for those of you on community water and wastewater systems, your operators do a lot of work to help protect you and to provide you with clean drinking water and safe wastewater facilities. It's a thankless job, but statistics show 
that the work they do impacts more of the community than doctors and nurses. I simply want to get across the point of how important it is to pay attention to our water and our wastewater facilities because it's much easier to maintain systems to prevent problems than it is to respond to emergencies. Think about it in terms of your car. If you do absolutely no maintenance and wait until your car breaks down to fix it, that gets really expensive. Whereas if you change the oil, the filters, belts, etc., it's going to run smoothly and last you a lot longer. It's the same idea with a septic tank, only it's less complicated. So next up, the what. What is a septic system? Unless you work in the industry or saw it being installed on your home, you may not even be aware. A lot of people don't realize that they're even on a septic system until a problem occurs and they have a backup of sewage in their yard. So when it comes to small on-site septic systems, why do we treat wastewater? Again, it comes back to the public health and environmental issues. The backup in your yard can be harmful. While it may not impact us on the scale of the great stink in London, insufficient treatment and maintenance can put you, your neighbors, and your community at risk. Children and wildlife may encounter the wastewater and become carriers of the disease spreading them throughout communities. So what exactly is a septic system and what does it do? Generally, it starts with the collection system in your homes. The drain pipes from your sinks, toilets, showers, laundry machine, dishwasher, they all collect the wastewater and move it to the outside of your home away from where you are. Similar to the London sewer design, trying to remove it from human contact. The waste enters your septic tank where gravity and time allow the solids and liquids to separate. The naturally occurring bacteria in your tanks then break down the solids. The liquids then leave the tank and are dispersed through a system of drain fields which filter through the soil aided by naturally occurring bacteria and evapotranspiration. But let's really look at each step so that it makes sense. The first part of the system is your home plumbing and as I said the toilets, sinks, baths, etc. all play a part. If they aren't working right, they can cause backups, which cause human interaction with wastewater, which in turn causes illness. So it's important to make sure that all of these are working correctly. When the wastewater leaves your house, it will usually pass through a cleanout. What is a cleanout? It's exactly what it sounds like. It's an access port where a plumber can use equipment to access your drain lines to clean them out if you have a clog or a backup. In the picture on the slide, you can see what we call a two-way cleanout, in that it gives you access to clean both directions of your line. Now this photo shows it before it's buried, so you won't actually see all of this in the field. You'll see just the two access caps on top. After your home, the wastewater then enters your septic tank. If you look at the photo on the bottom left, you can see a section view of a typical septic tank with two chambers separated by a baffle. The water enters the tank on the left where it says inlet. In the first chamber, the wastewater has time to settle out the majority of the solids so that the sludge lays on the bottom of the tank. That sludge serves as a breeding ground for anaerobic or non-oxygen bacteria that eats and breaks down the solids. The scum floats to the top and the liquid water continues on to the second chamber. Now when you need to access your septic tank for an inspection or have it pumped, it's done through an access hatch on top of the tank. There are usually two of them, one on the inlet chamber and one on the outlet chamber. It's important to know where these hatches are, both for emergencies and so that you can do the proper maintenance on your tank. Most times, the tanks are installed below grade where the access hatches end up getting buried, so you may have to do some digging. Ideally, the contractor will have installed a riser that makes it easier on you. Risers are usually PVC pipe that rest above the access hatch and has a plastic lid on them. With the riser, you won't have to dig up your hatch every time you need to access it. If you don't have one, I always suggest installing one. The last part of the tank itself that I want to mention is the effluent filter. 
As liquid waste leaves the tank, it will typically go through what is called an effluent filter. That filter simply blocks or prevents any solids that may have made it through the tank from leaving it and entering your drain field, where it can clog and shorten the life of your system. A lot of people take those out and throw them away. Please do not do that, because it will cause problems. Those filters are very important to keep the solids out of your drain field, so don't throw them away. You will, on, you will want to inspect them periodically and hose them off if they are clogged up. You can do it with a hose right inside your septic tank to remove any debris, and then you can reinsert them. Also, if your filter has gotten clogged, it's a good sign that it's probably time to have your tank professionally pumped. So after the liquid effluent leaves the septic tank, it encounters a distribution also known as a D-box. The D-box is a simple device that basically separates the flow from one pipe entering into several pipes leading out to your drain field. They are typically designed to evenly distribute the flow so that one area isn't overloaded, but rather the work is evenly distributed. Some are adjustable, so that if you have a problem with one leg, you can tweak the flow entering the different legs of your system. If you look at the left, you can see a standard concrete D-box during construction. It's taking the total flow from the left and distributing it over five drain field legs. You can see that two are already there and a third is being installed. And the fourth and fifth have yet to be installed. In the middle, you can see an adjustable D-box that allows flow to be diverted between the left and right lines. The flow is diverted by a small gear type insert shown on the right. By turning the gear, it raises or lowers the hole. The lower the hole is, the more flow it allows to pass through, and the higher it is, reduces the flow. Ideally, you would balance the flow among all legs of your system. Additionally, you may have a flow divider or diverter that uses a valve to control the flow. Pictured above is a flow diverter that allows you to change the amount of flow going to two leach lines. By turning it, you can provide more or less flow to whichever leg of the drain field you want. If one leg is getting too much flow and is saturated, you can divert more flow to the other leg to try and balance out the demand. Finally, after the effluent leaves the D-box or flow diverter, it enters your drain field. There are really two types of drain field that you can see pictured here. The right one is a perforated pipe, which really is a piece of PVC with holes punched through it, the length of the pipe. This allows the effluent to leach out into the soils. The left image is what's called a chamber system. You can think of a chamber as an arch or a tunnel, where the bottom of the tunnel is open to the soil. In both of these cases, they allow the effluent to enter spread out and infiltrate into the surrounding soils. At that point, the soils and bacteria act as a natural filter to catch any of the smaller particles and filter them out. So now that you know what a septic system is, how can septic systems fail? The biggest cause of failure is improper operation or use. Putting too much wastewater into a system that isn't designed for it we're putting things into the septic system that shouldn't be. Also, insufficient maintenance, not having it inspected and pumped regularly can be a cause of failure. Environmental issues like heavy rains, and lastly, incorrect design or construction. Sometimes systems are designed and installed by people that don't know how to do it correctly. They design the system too small, or they don't get the tank level during construction, which can cause failure. But why does it matter if it fails? Again, I cannot reiterate it enough. If your septic system fails and it backs up either inside or outside of your home, it puts you and your community at risk of serious illness. This can happen both through direct contact with the wastewater and also through contamination of your drinking water wells. So the first reason to maintain your system is to protect yourself and your community. Secondly is money. Now you might say, I can't afford to have someone come out every two to five years to inspect and pump my tank. But look at the costs. It will cost, on average, about $500 each trip to have someone inspect and pump your tank. If your tank fails, 
it will cost you anywhere from ten to twenty-five thousand dollars to replace it. And that's assuming that you have enough land to install a new one. So you can pay five hundred dollars every three years, let's say, to make sure that the system continues running for twenty plus years, or about thirty-five hundred dollars total. Or you can do nothing and have to replace it every ten to twenty years at a cost of ten to twenty-five thousand dollars. It will save you money in the long run. Again, just like a car, you have to change the oil, otherwise it will break down. The how. How can you make sure your septic system lasts? Regular operation and maintenance, or O&M, is the key. The operation part is the regular stuff, the daily, weekly type things that you do while you use it. When you learn these things and incorporate them into your habits, they become easy and second nature. The maintenance parts are the long-term items. These are the things that you do to the system itself to make sure it keeps running. So what are some of the O&M things you should be doing? First and foremost, know your system. Know where your septic tank is. Know where your drain field is and where your cleanout ports are. When these are originally installed, you should be provided plans that you can keep along with your service records. If you don't have these plans, make a sketch of what you do know. Also, there are flushable septic tank location devices that contractors can use to locate your tank. By having this information, if a problem occurs, you will know where to look or where to point someone to correct the issue. Second, make sure you repair all leaks that feed your septic system right away. All leaks. A faucet dripping one time every second adds up to more than 2,000 gallons per year. Even worse, a running toilet can waste about 200 gallons a day, or 73,000 gallons per year. Your septic tank is not designed to handle these flows, so pay attention to all leaks, all running toilets, anything like that that contributes to your septic system. If you can install low flow fixtures, or only run dishwashers when the load is full. Try and spread out your usage. Don't have everyone showering at the same time that you're doing laundry and running the dishwasher. Overall, this can be summarized as monitor your usage. Limit the number of people using the system to what it was designed for. In general, designs are completed for about two people per bedroom. So having more than that in your home can also overload your tank causing failure. Even simple things, like turning off the sink when you brush your teeth, can make a big difference. Lastly, divert other sources like rain gutters or sump pumps away from your septic system. So what about the don'ts? First, septic systems are not trash cans. They aren't designed to handle solids that do not break down. Fats and oils from cooking, diapers, wet wipes, cat litter, cigarette butts, coffee grounds, household chemicals, femi feminine care products, all of these things should never be put down your drain. They will cause your system to fail. It's only a matter of time. Larger, si larger solid items do not break down. Chemicals can kill the helpful anaerobic bacteria we talk about, which then prevents solids from breaking down. Don't plant things near your drain field, other than grass. Larger plants like trees or even shrubs have significant root structures that can damage or plug your systems. Don't drive or park your cars on your systems. It may seem like a great use of an otherwise open area, but you can compact the soil and crush the pipes and cause major problems. Along the same lines, do not dig, build, or pave over them as it causes the same problems and additionally can prevent evapotranspiration. Never inspect or enter your septic tank yourself. Always get a professional to inspect and service your tanks and leach fields. Next, don't overload your commode. I know we already mentioned it, but you need to monitor your water usage, but I'm repeating it on purpose. This is the most common reason that septic systems fail. Most people don't realize the burden they put on their systems by letting toilets run. Some additional things you can do to prevent overloading your tank, if you have a water softener, 
Don't allow the backwash water to enter your septic system. Don't add septic tank additives to your system. I know a lot of people like them and think they are helping, but most of the time they do not help and may even harm your system. The EPA does not recommend their usage, so why spend money on something that isn't doing anything for you? Save it for those professional inspections we talked about previously. Lastly, garbage disposals. How many of you have one? Most people don't realize the extra burden this adds to your system. You should always verify that your system was designed appropriately to account for a garbage disposal, as they are the equivalent of adding an extra person to your household. For example, if your septic tank or system was designed for a two-bedroom home with four people, and that is what you currently have living there, adding a garbage disposal would be like moving a fifth person, fifth person into the house. A lot more solids and water end up going down the drain when you have a garbage disposal, so be aware. Well, let's say your septic system has failed. How would you know? What are some of the signs you can look out for so that you know you have a problem and then you can get it fixed? Likely it won't be as obvious as the top right picture, but certainly if you have major erosion and your drain field is exposed, then your system has failed. Some of the more subtle signs that you are more likely to see are drains slowly draining or clogging. You may hear a gurgling sound in your plumbing. You may start to smell sewer odors both inside and outside of your home. The area around your tank and leach field may become wet or spongy even during the summer. Or you might notice pooling water or muddy soil. Lastly is plant growth. You may notice excessive plant growth around your system. So we've talked about the operations side and we've talked about what things you can keep an eye out for. But what about the maintenance? How often should you be having your tank pumped? Generally, the industry says every two to five years, but obviously that's a wide range. This table I came across when putting the presentation together is a great guide. If you look at it, the columns are listed as the number of people in your home, and the rows are the size of your septic tank. At that intersection of these two, it will give you an approximate time for how often you should have your tank pumped. Remember, this isn't the answer, as there really isn't one, but it's a good guide to go by. What else can be done to maintain the system? Have it inspected. This should be done both by you regularly and by a professional every time the tank is pumped. For your part, regularly, you want to keep an eye out for those signs I mentioned earlier. Surfacing water, sewer odors, etc. If you notice these, get someone out to pump and inspect as soon as you can. You can also periodically check your effluent filter to make sure it isn't clogged. If it is, remove it, hose it off, clean it, reinstall it. A clogged filter is also a good sign that it may be time to have your tank pumped, as it means that solids are reaching the outlet. Older septic tanks may not have a filter, and if so, I'd recommend having one installed to prevent failures. As for the professional inspection, it should be done, like I said, every time the tank is pumped. That way they can actually see the interior of your tank to assess the condition, whereas if you do it when it's normally operating and full, then they really can't see much. Lastly, who should be conducting these inspections when it's pumped? Only a licensed contractor. They deal with these things regularly and they know what they're looking for and they know how to do it safely. Two things to be aware of as the owner. The first is to make sure that the contractor is properly pumping out your septic tank. This means that they should be breaking up the solids, or fog as it's known, the fats, oils, and greases on top and bottom, and sucking all of it out, not just the liquids. Sometimes contractors will say it's too thick, but make sure they take the time to pump that out. Otherwise, you aren't really getting what you need done. The second is to make sure that they refill your tank with water afterwards. In some areas, the tanks can float and will pop up out of the ground without the weight of the water holding them down, like you see in the picture here. Your tank will usually fill up within a week or so from general use, but by refilling it immediately, you prevent the likelihood of this happening to you. Also, 
If the area where you live has a significant wet season and the ground is highly saturated, you should avoid pumping during this time as well. Lastly, when it comes to o and I wanted to cover the as-builts or plans I mentioned earlier in the presentation. Whenever your septic system is or was installed, you should receive something similar to one of these plans. They show your system as it was built, hence the name as-built. They are an invaluable tool to have handy as they tell you where your tank is, what size it is, how much drain field you have, and other useful facts. Additionally, some of the newer plans will show an aerial view that helps to locate the system in reference to your home or other features. Notice the number listed on the chart at the top. These are called swing ties, and they are accurate measurements of where your system is in relation to surface features like the corner of your home or a power pole, things that typically do not move so they can be relied on. The way the table works is you will have a column of letters and a row of numbers or vice versa. These letters and numbers correspond to locations on the map and the distance listed at their intersection on the chart is the distance between the two points. For example, on the plan on the right, the top corner of the home is listed as A and the septic tank inlet is listed as 1. The distance between these points is 31 feet. The bottom corner of the home is B, and the distance from there to the same inlet, 1, is 32.6 feet. If you do a swing from both of these points at those distances, the points where they cross, the point where they cross, will be where that inlet is. Now there are a few variations of drain fields that you may run into. The first is a mound system. These are used when there are conditions like high groundwater or bedrock. It works basically the same as a traditional septic system, except that it has a pump to pump the liquid effluent to a raised drain field. In the slide you can see where the septic tank is. Everything up to that point is exactly the same as we discussed previously. At that point, the effluent enters a dosing chamber where the effluent liquid is pumped into an elevated drain field or mound. If you see a, se a second chamber like this that has a pump, and if your leach field is built up above the natural grade, these are good signs that you may have a mound system. The image on the left shows you a typical pumping chamber, which will have a pump and typically three floats that control when to turn on or off your pump. The first is the low level, or off float. When water is below this, it turns off the pump. The second is the high water, or on float. When water gets above this level, it tells the pump to turn on. The third is usually an alarm float that will alert you to a problem. If water has gotten to this point and the alarm is on, you will want to reduce your water usage until the problem is solved. The only additional maintenance needed for a mound system is associated with the pumping chamber. Every year you should be checking the pump chamber to make sure that the pump and floats are all working properly. Perform the pump maintenance per the manufacturer's recommendations provided during your install and check the electrical parts and conduits for corrosion. If the alarm has a push to test button, it should be pushed to check it. While it isn't a new item, I want to emphasize again the importance of making sure the septic system tank effluent filter is clear and installed. If solids get into your pumping chamber, they can or will cause failure of the pump. It is much easier and cheaper to maintain that filter than to replace an expensive pump. On this slide, we're just showing a few pictures of a mound system under construction. And again, here are a few more. Here are a few pictures of completed or installed mounds. In maintaining the mound, similar to any other leach field, you must know where your system is. Make sure surface water flows are diverted away from the mound 
Do not drive or park vehicles on the mound. Don't allow livestock on the mound. And don't plant anything other than grass on a mound. Maintaining grass on the mound system will help prevent erosion in the long run and is recommended. The second variation of septic system you might see is a seepage pit or a cesspool. This is used in areas with reduced access to land. If you don't have room for large drain fields, this is the sort of vertical drain field. As you can see in the left image, the setup of, this, of the system is the same as a traditional system, except that the drain field is replaced by a seepage pit. This pit is a hole that is bored down into the ground, and then a concrete or masonry cylinder is inserted. The outer areas are filled with rock and gravel to allow flow, and then the concrete has holes in it that allow the effluent to filter out into the rock and surrounding soils. Here you can see what the boring equipment looks like and what it does. It's basically a large drill that excavates a hole. On the right is a sample of what the concrete cylinder insert and lid would look like. In general, a seepage pit does not require any additional maintenance outside of what is required for a traditional septic system. Again, you want to make sure not to be driving or parking equipment or vehicles on it. Periodically, it may be necessary to pump out solids or biofilm that have collected in the pit, and this would be best determined by a professional inspection. Now, I know we've gone over a lot of information today, and I hope I haven't overloaded you. But in case you would like to learn more about septic systems, here are two links to EPA websites that contain a lot of good information on septic systems and how to operate and maintain them. Lastly, you can always contact your local IHS SFC office for assistance. Thanks again for your time and take care.